I'm Gavin Rees and I work for Dart Centre Europe. The Dart Centre is a network of journalists and filmmakers whose work concerns trauma and tragedy. And today I'd like to talk to you about the challenges of interviewing people during this time of COVID-19. You may be working with someone who's been directly affected by the virus. Perhaps they've been ill themselves or perhaps they've lost somebody close to them. But your conversation may be a remote one with someone who's been affected by a different kind of traumatic incident. Interviews on emotionally sensitive subjects, such as illness, bereavement, or domestic violence, require a different kind of approach than general news stories do. First of all, make sure you see the person before the story. Nobody likes to be approached as if they're nothing more than an illustration for a preconceived idea. With COVID, of course, you also need to make a decision about whether you can meet in person or whether the interview needs to be done remotely. Sensitive interviews require specific planning and structure around them. If you're going to meet physically, make sure that you do a thorough risk assessment, being unsure about what hygiene measures to take or what physical distance to keep can make the situation more stressful, both for the person you're talking to and yourself. Secondly, allow plenty of time, more than you might first think. People may get caught up in their emotions and it's best not to hurry them when they're discussing things they already find a struggle to talk about. If your interview touches upon domestic abuse or sexual assault, doing some extra research on these topics beforehand is a good idea. These interviews often demand more precise knowledge. Most people experience a traumatic event as a fundamental loss of control, and just talking about it later can bring back some of the same feelings. Add to that the fact that most people have minimal experience of working with the media, and it's easy to see how an interview, if it's not done carefully, can leave somebody feeling even more disempowered. That's why it's best practice to try and think through and find all the little ways that you can extend options to the interviewee and involve them in the decision-making process. Think maximal consideration. If you're meeting in person, you can ask them whether they would like to be interviewed or whether they would like a friend or family member there for support. If the conversation is likely to be wide-ranging or deals with things that happened in the past, do give people a good idea of what you're interested in. People can be unsettled by directions they're not expecting. You could also check in advance to see if there are areas they really don't want to talk about. Given that the conversation could be emotionally draining, it's a good idea to ask your interviewee when they like to have the most energy for it. They may also want to build some space around it if they need to do something else important soon afterwards. What you're trying to do is to create a safe environment for the interview in which people know what to expect and are clear about what they're consenting to. During the conversation itself, however, people are like to feel more secure when they know they're being heard. All of the best interviewers have great listening skills. If you're interested in developing yours further, try Googling active or non-judgmental listening. There's lots out there. Here are some more thoughts about things that you might try during the conversation. Remote interviews are tricky for a number of reasons. If you're recording them for online or broadcast, then dealing with the technology can significantly add to your interviewee's stress levels and anxiety. And so it's important to be doubly patient and explain everything carefully, perhaps so that everyone finds the technology back then. Remote interviews on sensitive subjects are also difficult because it's harder to gauge people's reactions or reassure them that they've become lost in an emotion. That sense of human connection can feel weaker. And so on Zoom, use plenty of eye contact. Asking someone to describe their environment, what the room is like, or the weather out of the window, can help close that feeling of distance. Acknowledgement is really important. Saying something like, I'm really sorry that this happened to you, can make a big difference. Rechecking permissions throughout the conversation is also good practice. For example, just before a potentially challenging question, you might add in a quick, do you mind if I ask you about dot, 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 dot. Personally, I'd avoid asking people, how did you feel? When strong emotions lie just millimetres under the surface, that question can really upset people and potentially derail the whole interview. You might ask instead, perhaps something along the lines of, what impact has this had on you and your family? Be careful too about bringing your own emotional situation into the interview. With COVID-19, it's very easy to project one's own understandings and feelings upon the interviewee, and that can really cloud things. 
That all said, it's great practice to acknowledge how hard this must be and to acknowledge what the person has gone through. Um, but whatever you do, make sure that you don't say, I know how you feel. Everybody's unique. And the chances that somebody will believe you when you say that are almost minimal. The end of the interview isn't the end of the process, nor the end of the journalist's responsibilities towards their interviewee. How the piece is written can have a big impact. Something that's accurate and insightful can leave someone feeling understood and heard. On the other hand, something that's unfair and insensitively written can compound stigma and leave lasting damage. If you're writing about someone's death, try to capture some sense of that person's life as well. It's hard for relatives or friends to read something that reduces their loved one just to the bare details of their death. Accuracy matters more than most people would imagine. Even small mistakes can cut deep. They may give the impression that the journalist wasn't genuinely concerned. It's really important not to promise anything that one can't deliver. If there's a chance that the piece won't run, best to warn the person ahead of time. Do follow up with people and check back in. Send them a link to the piece, see how they're doing, and thank them once more. One last thing. Self-care is vital for anyone who's doing trauma-related work. It's hard to be an effective and sensitive interviewer if one is feeling overwhelmed by the subject matter. And so after the interview, do make sure that you check in with yourself and take some extra time to work through any issues that have come up. All the advice in this video comes from the Dart Centre's network of journalists and filmmakers. To find out more about what we do, visit www.dartcentre.org.